Okay, cool. Yeah, so for those of you that uh, weren't here last week, um, we, we had a really cool session with Prof Hofmeyer on uh, preventing complications during cesarean sections. Um, and yeah, it's in the Google Drive folder for those of you who missed it. Um, so you're welcome to download that and have a look. Um, and Prof's very kindly offered to do another session this week um, on some of the um, updated recommendations for the management of postpartum hemorrhage. Um, Prof is presenting to us all the way from Botswana where he's doing some work at the University of Botswana. Um, and once again, Prof, it's a real privilege to have you join us. And uh, thank you so much for your valuable time. Uh, we appreciate it. Over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dylan. Um, I, uh, and, and hello to everyone. I, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll stop my video and, and just talk to the slides. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? So today I'd like to go through the basics of postpartum hemorrhage prevention and management briefly, but then I'd like to identify the knowledge gaps and particularly um, some sort of, I think, um, incorrect knowledge that is around and talk a bit about new research on postpartum hemorrhage. Slide, please. So uh, I think you're all aware that postpartum hemorrhage is the leading cause of deaths of mother in the world. Um, most postpartum hemorrhage deaths are preventable. And, and this is um, the biggest evidence of this is that very, very few women in countries such as the UK ever die from postpartum hemorrhage. So it's really a preventable cause if you have um, treatment available. The latest South African confidential inquiry into maternal deaths in fact, the only cause of maternal death, which was on the increase, was hemorrhage after cesarean section. Not only due to more cesarean sections being done, but also to an increasing case fatality rate um, for hemorrhage after cesarean section. Um, and that's, we talked a bit about that last week. Slide, please. So when I moved to the Eastern Cape in 2000, one of the first things I did was to draw up a number of posters um, with treatment algorithms for common uh, emergencies such as postpartum hemorrhage and preeclampsia, declampsia. And this is the one we drew up then. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, it, it has been updated in the Western Cape. And I thank Sue Forkus um, from University of Cape Town for this updated version. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to take you through this. Um, we first of all have prevention, and it's now, I think, internationally recognized that every single woman should have a uterotonic at delivery. We're fortunate that we have oxytocin available, which is the safest and one of the most effective um, uterotonics. Um, we deliver the placenta with controlled cord traction. The, uh, we did a big trial with WHO showing that the shall we say the, the contribution of controlled cord traction to reducing postpartum hemorrhage was not huge, but it definitely was there. So provided you've been trained, WHO recommends you should use controlled cord traction. I want to make a big emphasis uh, on delayed clamping onto the cord. I think I did this last week as well. Um, that simple act of waiting for up to three minutes, but at least for one minute before clamping the cord has a huge impact on the infant's health in terms of the risk of anemia during infancy. So the placental transfusion, the blood transfused from the placenta to the baby in the first minutes after birth is a very, very important physiological um, contribution to the baby's um, cell uh, mass and should not be interrupted with early cord clamping. This is particularly so for preterm babies. And, you know, the, the, it's interesting that the, the first, uh, the first, well, we were the first to suggest the possibility in the 1980s that quick clamping of the cord in preterm babies might provoke a sudden increase in blood pressure, which would result in intraventricular hemorrhage. 
And there's now a huge body of evidence showing that early clamping of the cord in preterm babies not only increases the risk for um, intraventricular hemorrhage, but significantly increases the death, neonatal deaths. So delaying clamping in preterm babies is not only sort of advantageous to their health, but it actually um, reduces their risk of dying. Um, for women who are at high risk of postpartum hemorrhage, one can consider additional oxytocin by means of an infusion, because oxytocin actually has a fairly short half-life, or if the woman is not hypertensive or a cardiac, adding ergometrin to the oxytocin. And ergometrin is available either by itself as a um, 0.2 milligram vial or as sintometrin, which is five inter, uh, international units plus 0.5 milligrams of ergometrin. And these can be given intramuscularly or intravenously. How do we diagnose postpartum hemorrhage? Well, that's blood loss more than 500 mils after birth or any bleeding which appears excessive. If you're worried about the bleeding, then you need to diagnose postpartum hemorrhage or if the mother is showing signs of hemorrhagic shock, whether or not you've actually um, identified 500 mils of blood loss, you, you diagnose postpartum hemorrhage. And the, remember that postpartum hemorrhage is one of those emergencies where we absolutely depend on that team approach to management. Um, and the team approach is not something just in theory, it's something one needs to practice. So postpartum hemorrhage management is one of those things which actually in small hospitals doesn't happen all that often. So you can't rely on um, getting practice from when you're doing it for real. You need to have fire drills. So perhaps at least once a month, you need to have a fire drill where out of the blue, someone says there's a postpartum hemorrhage, a bed number so-and-so in the labor ward, and the people on duty need to call the team together um, establish the, um, that everyone in the team knows who the members of the team are, what their respective jobs are, who's leading the resuscitation, who's, who's keeping notes, who's running to fetch supplies, um, who is um, managing the patient directly. So it's a team effort which requires coordination and, and leadership. The, the initial resuscitation, one can't really give a sequence to because everything needs to be done at the same time. And depending on what is actually happening to your patient at the moment, you may vary the sequence, but really at the same time, you need to rub up the uterus, give by manual compression to try and stop the bleeding, call for assistance, um, get good access, good venous access to give large volumes of fluid, infuse fluid fast as well as an oxytocic and usually our first oxytocic would be 20 units in a litre of ringer's lactate, assuming the woman has already had 10 international units intramuscularly for prevention. And then we need to maintain her blood pressure with clear fluids. Um, there's no benefit from volume expanders. And I think there, there's some evidence that volume expanders carry certain risks. So our initial resuscitation is just quickly giving volume with clear fluids. Um, we need a urinary catheter in to monitor blood loss and also to empty the bladder because a full bladder may be aggravating the situation. And then we obviously monitor blood pressure, pulse, and urine after the next slide. And now we're just moving down in that chart from the Western Cape. Um, then, then we have two questions we want to ask. Um, what is the status of the placenta and what is the status of the uterus? So is the placenta delivered? If it's not delivered, um, we need to repeat cord traction if the cord is, is still attached. Um, if the woman's bleeding and the cord is not attached, we need to do, or, or the placenta can't be removed with cord traction, we need to do a manual removal of the placenta. Um, ideally, that should be done in theater with a, um, anesthesia if possible, or at least, adequate analgesia because it's an extremely painful procedure. However, the reality is sometimes we have to do this in labor ward as a life-saving procedure. Um, just do try to give the mother 
the best analgesia you can, possibly um, intravenous opioid or something, at least something um, to help with the pain because it's, it, it's a traumatic procedure, but you need to insert your whole hand up into the uterus. If the cord is there, you follow the cord to find the placenta. Um, you then um, find the edge of the placenta and you resist the temptation to grab onto the placenta and pull it out because that will just, you, all you'll do is pull out little bits at a time. The idea of manual removal is to completely separate the placenta from the uterus before removing it intact. So you find the edge of the placenta and then you use the edge of your hand, uh, almost like a spoon, and you just develop that um, plane of cleavage between the placenta of the uterus and just purposefully work your way um, between the placenta of the uterus in every direction and keep going until every um, part of the placenta has been separated from the uterus. And when you get to that point, you'll find that the whole placenta is lying in the palm of your hand. And all you need to do is then close your hand around the whole placenta and remove the placenta as one. Um, that's the ideal way of manual removal. It's not always possible. Sometimes the placenta is morbidly adherent and you absolutely can't remove it. And you have to try um, every other method available, swab holding forceps to try and pull out bits of placenta. Um, the most useful instrument is a very large curette. You know, this needs to be a curette at least five centimeters diameter. And unfortunately, often these are not available, but that's one thing please to order for your labor wards is a postpartum size curette, because that is really useful um, in the postpartum uterus to remove a um, densely adherent piece, piece of placenta and ensure that the uterus is empty. Um, and then uh, th this particular um, set of uh, instructions is actually they can as soon as the patient is stable. Um, if the placenta is incomplete, um, then uh, the patient needs evacuation of the uterus. And uh, I see my connection is unstable. So um, if I do drop off, um, I hope I'll have some way of knowing that, uh, but I'm going to just carry on. Um, so at the MOU, they would refer, refer, in your hospitals, you would take the patient to theater, preferably for an evacuation of the uterus. As I said, vital to have the large postpartum size curette for evacuation. If the placenta is completely removed, we turn our attention to the uterus. And um, there are three things the uterus may be. It may be soft or firm or not felt. And the, the most rare one is not felt. If, if you feel for the uterus and there's nothing there, then quickly diagnose inverge, inverted uterus. It's not common, but it does happen. And the patient becomes extremely shocked, not from blood loss. It's a, um, uh, it's, it's a um, sort of sympathetic type of shock. And, the, um, and if you are there at the time that the inversion of the uterus happens, you need to very quickly place your whole hand into the vagina, um, place the palm of your hand around the um, uterus, which is now inside out within the vagina, and gently squeezing it steadily and firmly, try and push that whole uterus back up into the abdomen. In other words, it's turned inside out inside the vagina. You need to push it back up into its correct position, the right way up, in the, um, in, in the abdomen. If you can't return it um, manually like that, it's absolutely worthwhile trying the, um, uh, hemo, uh, it is called the, I always remember the, forget the person's name, um, but it's the hydrostatic replacement method. And the, it, it's a very elegant way of re replacing the uterus. But the most difficult part of it is you need to form a seal of the um, mother's valve around the tube that's, provide, that's uh, supplying fluid to the vagina. So 
you, you need a, a liter of saline. You need preferably a wide, fairly wide bore tube, although you can just use drip tubing if that's all you have. Um, but what works best is actually to have something like one of those um, uh, rubber vacuum cups, the silk cup or the silastic cup attached to thicker tubing, a, a sterile tubing attached to your um, saline source. And then you put the large end of the vacuum cup into the uterus. The, the alternative thing you can use is a very wide borefoli catheter with a big balloon, blow up the balloon as big as you can with about 50 or 60 mils of fluid, put that into the vagina. And then with your two hands, you try to form a seal around the tube and you run fluid into the vagina. And if you can form a, an adequate seal and the fluid doesn't run out, almost inevitably over time, as the fluid builds up pressure in the vagina, that pressure will slowly but surely push the uterus back up into the abdomen. Um, if that doesn't happen, uh, and you are completely unable to reduce the inverted uterus from below, you need to take the patient to the theater and do a laparotomy. Because what, what often has happened is that the, sorry, one other thing to mention is that um, giving a uterine relaxant may help, something like salbutamol, a beta stimulant to relax the uterus, because what's happened is that the lower part of the upper segment has clamped down um, and is forming a constriction ring. And it's not possible to get the um, fundus of the uterus back through that constriction ring. And by relaxing the uterus, you can sometimes get the fundus back through. If that doesn't work, you need to take the patient to theater. Sometimes deep anesthesia. In, in the old days, we used to use um, I forget now the, the gas, halothane. We used to use halothane. I doubt it's still available. But that was a very good way of relaxing the uterus. And that can also enable one to push the fundus back up from below. If all else fails, unfortunately, you need to do a laparotomy. And what you'll see is a ring. And then the uterus, you'll see the outside of the uterus disappearing down into the vagina through a muscular ring. And you need to actually cut through that ring in the midline anteriorly to be able to then um, get hold of the um, uh, fundus of the uterus with tissue forceps and pull it back up in, into the abdomen. Okay, that's enough on uh, inverted uterus. It's rare, but you need to know what to do when it happens. If the uterus is soft, we need to get it to contract. We can massage the uterus, expel clots. We continue our oxytocin in fusion. Um, I actually wrote to Sue Forkus and she agreed with me that tranexamic acid shouldn't really be at this point. Tranexamic acid should have been on the first screen we showed because part of your initial resuscitation should include tranexamic acid provided, the, um, provided it's within three hours of the birth. So I'm sure you all have heard of that, aware of the huge woman trial um, I think they, they had something like 30,000 women with postpartum hemorrhage, and they showed that if tranexamic acid, the gram intravenously, is given within three hours of birth, um, there's a reduction in death. Not a reduction in hemorrhage, a redu actual reduction in death. However, if the tranexamic acid was given after three hours, the trend was in the opposite direction. So we only use it in the first three hours after birth. Um, we can use other uterotonics. We can use ergometrin, half a milligram, or sintometrin. Um, I'm going to talk just now about misoprostol because misoprostol is very poorly understood and um, overused, and I'm going to go into that in some detail. The next step, if there continues to be bleeding from the uterus, um, is to try and stop that bleeding by mechanical means. And currently the recommendation of WHO is uterine balloon tamponade. Um, that's also controversial and I'm going to go into it in some detail. If the uterus is firm and is not bleeding, um, one looks for lacerations, um, which need to be sutured, particularly the cervix, 
um, uh, the, uh, to suture those lacerations um, and to keep on suturing until you stop the bleeding. If the cervix is bleeding, um, you just put sutures in. If it doesn't stop, just keep putting in sutures. Um, if you put in enough good, well-tied figure of eight sutures, soon enough you will stop the bleeding. Sometimes there's a continuing ooze from the vagina, which really um, no more suturing. It's sort of a superficial ooze from all the tissues. And then you can put in a big pack, something, not a small swab, something like an abdominal swab, um, which you, you pack up um, firmly into the vagina. That will usually stop the local causes of bleeding. Um, and we've talked about the um, uterus that's not felt. Um, and of course, if you're at a clinic, refer the patient as soon as you've got control of the bleeding. Next slide. So uh, let's talk a bit about misoprostol. It's, it's, a, it's a very, um, misoprostol is, is, a, is a drug that um, I think has been uh, very popular among doctors for, for many years. And what's interesting about it is that um, nobody ever thought of using it in, in, in obstetric patients. Uh, and it had actually been on the market for many years um, for treatment of um, uh, ulceration related to non-steroidal non anti-inflammatories. Um, and the first people to think of using misoprostol in obstetrics were in fact women in South America who, who actually read the package insert. And the package insert said, um, misoprostol should not be used in pregnancy because it may cause abortion. And they said, well, well that's, that's, that's very interesting. So, so they took it and, and indeed it's become known now as one of the most effective drugs um, for inducing abortion and, and has been in fact a very useful drug globally for this, for this indication. However, we then thought that we could use it in, in the third trimester of pregnancy. Um, and in the 1990s, from about 1989 onwards, there was a huge amount of research done in which we were very much involved um, on the use of misoprostol, firstly to induce labor. And that was a complete disaster. And, uh, you know, globally, um, the medical profession, I estimate, killed thousands, if if not tens of thousands of women with misoprostol um, through ruptures of the through rupturing the uterus by using um, excessive doses of misoprostol to induce labor. And I'll show you a little bit about this later on. Um, the next uh, very attractive idea was to use misoprostol for the prevention or treatment of postpartum hemorrhage, because it appeared to be the absolutely ideal drug. Um, for that. It was um, heat stable, very cheap, active orally, and it had an extremely powerful neutrotonic effect being a prostaglandin E1 analog. Um, and in 1995, in fact, at Coronation Hospital in Johannesburg, we conducted the first ever randomized trials of misoprostol to prevent and treat postpartum hemorrhage. We, we thought we were on the way to a Nobel Prize because this was going to the, the discovery which would um, change the world of postpartum hemorrhage. And what I want to say in a nutshell is it was a massive disappointment. As a researcher, you learn to be disappointed. I would say as a researcher, nine of every 10 ideas you have turn out to be a disappointment. And misoprostol for treating and preventing postpartum hemorrhage was a massive disappointment. Next slide, please. So let's just quickly go through the story. Um, the first actual publication was um, in 1998 uh, from El and um, Charles Rodick's group in, in London, who treated 14 women with postpartum hemorrhage. They gave them a gram of misop, sorry, um, a thousand micrograms, that's a milligram rectally. And in all 14 women, the bleeding stopped within three minutes. 100%. You know, this appeared to be the most spectacular treatment for postpartum hemorrhage ever. Next slide, please. Um, there was also a report from King Edward Hospital, Lokogamage, 
in 2001. It was a randomized study um, of misoprostol for the treatment of postpartum hemorrhage, comparing misoprostol with sintametrin. Um, and apparently the misoprostol was much more effective than sintametrin because the, the bleeding failed to stop in 11 out of 32 patients with ergometrin and only two out of 30 with misoprostol. However, this outcome was not blind and it was a subjective outcome. In other words, the doctors who were prescribing the misoprostol, the oxytocin, knew what the patient was receiving and they decided whether the bleeding had stopped or not. It was a purely subjective outcome. And one needs to be very cautious about that kind of trial because we're all, we all have emotions related to misoprostol and our subjectivity can always be um, influenced by our personal emotions. Next slide, please. So um, we conducted two placebo-controlled trials um, of misoprostol uh, treatment where we gave all the normal treatment. We gave our patients uh, so we gave our patients oxytocin infusions, um, uh, uterine compression, everything. But in addition, we gave them either misoprostol or placebo. And we did these two trials together um, with my colleague, Heiswal Ravan, who is at the MRC Institute in, in the Gambia. And in both of those trials, in fact, the women who received misoprostol did a bit better. There were fewer um, treatment failures um, with misoprostol than with placebo. Neither of the trials in themselves were statistically significant. Um, they had quite small sample sizes. When we put them together, we seemed to get a significant result. So this was fairly reassuring, um, but was not conclusive. Next slide, please. So we went on with WHO to do a huge trial. Um, and uh, we, we, um, uh, we were involved with this trial also at Free and Cecilia Makiwani Hospital. So in this trial, instead of recruiting a few hundred women, we, recru we recruited 1,400 women with postpartum hemorrhage. All the women received routine treatment, but in addition, in a double-blind way, they received either misoprostol 600 micrograms or placebo. In the women who received misoprostol, 86 per, 80%, sorry, 86% of them, the bleeding stopped. Next slide, please. In the woman who received um, uh, placebo, 86% of them, the bleeding stopped. Exactly the same. There was not one percentage better um, response with misoprostol than with placebo. And this was in a huge international WHO um, run double blind placebo controlled study. So what we know from that is once a woman has received oxytocin or ergometrin or our current established uterotonics, her uterus has contracted as well as it's going to contract. And giving misoprostol in addition, which we know is much, much less effective than oxytocin, has no additional benefit. Next slide, please. Um, and and here, we are, here we put together the results of all of those trials. So you see Cheswal uh, Ravan's trial in Gambia, our, our South African trial, one trial that was done in Pakistan, which was similar to our small trials, and then the big WHO trial, and overall, no significant benefit for treatment of misoprostol over and above routine treatment with oxytocin and or sintometrin. Next slide, please. Um, we then conducted a large systematic review because people always feel, well, why not just give the misoprostol? We're desperate, this woman's bleeding. Why not just give her the misoprostol? Maybe it will help. You've got to remember that in medicine, nothing comes free. There is no effective treatment in medicine that does no harm. If a, if a treatment is absolutely harmless, you can be sure it's also absolutely um, ineffective. So we reviewed all the data from all the trials in which um, 
misoprostol was compared either with placebo or with other drugs, and we looked at the effect on blood loss, pyrexia, and maternal deaths. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so first of all, blood loss greater than 1,000 mils. Um, when misoprostol was used um, for prevention of postpartum hemorrhage compared with other uterotonics, it was much, much less effective. Far more women, so the, the risk ratio was 1.36 and very tight contrast intervals. So the, the other drugs, most of them were oxytocin, we know are much more effective than misoprostol. Um, interestingly, misoprostol 400 micrograms or 500 micrograms, the, the difference was not quite as dramatic. So, but nevertheless, um, other drugs, usually oxytocin were 22% more effective than 400 micrograms. But four or 500, but they were 36% more effective than 600 micrograms for prevention. Next slide, please. What about misoprostol against placebo? Um, 600 micrograms, there was a trend to um, better outcomes, but not significant. And 400 micrograms, slightly greater trend, but still not significant. So still no clear evidence that for prevention, Misoprostol is better than placebo. Next slide, please. Comparing 600 versus 400 micrograms, um, there were a number of trials which were direct comparisons. And then there were trials which where we could indirectly compare 600 with 400 micrograms um, via either placebo or other uterotonics. And we, when we put all those data together, there was absolutely no difference in effectiveness between 400 and 600 micrograms. So the idea that more is better does not apply to misoprostol. Once you're at 400 micrograms, if it's effective at all, you're at the maximum effective dose. Going to 600 does not improve effectiveness. And there's reason to believe that 200 may be just as good as 400. Next slide, please. What about physiological studies? There have been two physiological studies which have looked at the effect of misoprostol on um, uterine contraction, and they have found absolutely no difference in the effect on contraction from 200 up to 800 micrograms, whereas the side effects such as pyrexia obviously go up and up as the dose increases. And in the first trial, and I, I met Dr. Chong actually at a, at a conference many years ago, 20 years ago or so, um, where he presented these results, and he explained how, I think the eighth case, these were healthy volunteers who volunteered for a purely scientific physiological experiment. They didn't need misoprostol at all. They were healthy volunteers, and the eighth patient, who they gave 800 micrograms to, um, went into hyperpyrexia with multi-organ failure in ICU and very nearly died. Um, I can't imagine anything more um, stressful for a researcher. But just to emphasize that misoprostol postpartum in big doses can be lethal. It can cause um, fatal hyperpyrexia and multi-organ failure. Next slide, please. So what about the safety? Next slide, please. When we put together all the um, studies, first of all, the major side effect is pyrexia. And you can see clearly that when you compare misoprostol with anything else um, in whatever dosage, um, there is far more pyrexia. And the bigger the dose, the more the pyrexia. Next slide, please. Maternal death. So usually studies aren't big enough to measure maternal death, but when we put together all the studies of misoprostol in which there were maternal deaths, where misoprostol was compared either with other eutrotonics or, with, um, uh, or with, uh, with placebo, there were 15 deaths. 
and 11 occurred with misoprostol and four occurred with either or other uterotonics or placebo. So the one thing we can say for sure is there's absolutely no evidence that misoprostol reduces maternal death. And there's quite strong suggestion that use of misoprostol may increase the risk of the mother dying for the reasons that I've mentioned. Next slide, please. Why is this? We, the point is that misoprostol, unlike oxytocin, is not a simple uterotonic. It's a prostaglandin. We know that prostaglandin receptors occur in almost every organ and cell in the body. And so whereas oxytocin targets the oxytocin receptors in the uterus, it has some other mild effects, but that's not great. Misoprostol affects every organ, and it has effects on, well, on, on the, on the um, temperature centers, um, te temperature control centers, it affects platelet function, it affects, it has major cardiovascular effects. Um, and all of these can impact on maternal survival. Next slide, please. So what is the place um, for, or how should we look at misoprostol? What I've suggested, we should shift our attention from misoprostol, it's not going to solve the world's problems of PPH. We should rather focus on what works. We know that oxytocin works. Let's make oxytocin available. The only place for the use of misoprostol, because we know it is a mild uterotonic, is when no oxytocin is available. So if you're working in a rural situation where there is no oxytocin, then that is the only place you should use misoprostol. And if you use it, um, there's really no evidence that you should use more than 400 micrograms. And uh, I know that WHO recommend higher dosages. There are reasons for this. I'm not going to go into them now if, 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 if we can talk about that. Um, but I would really encourage people to resist the temptation um, to use misoprostol because it's such a popular drug. We, we know it's a extremely powerful drug. If you want to, if you want to terminate a, the, a pregnancy, there, there's no more effective drug than, than misoprostol. But, in the, but after delivery, um, in big dosages, uh, it is not that effective and it can be um, dangerous. Next slide, please. Uh, recently, we've completed a very big uh, tr trial with WHO called the CHAMPION trial. We, we did this also at Fred Cecilia Makiwani Hospitals. Um, and this was to try and get over the problem that oxytocin needs to be kept in a fridge. And uh, I'm sure all of you have had the experience where you try to stimulate labor when someone's not progressing in labor. And you put up oxytocin and you just run more and more and more oxytocin and nothing happens. And the truth is, in our settings, the oxytocin often has not adhered to a cold chain and may in fact not be effective. So what we are looking at is a heat stable of oxytocin, heat stable carbitocin. Next slide, please. Um, we did a huge trial again. We, we randomized 30,000 women to oxytocin or heat stable carbitocin. We found they were equally effective. Um, and so this is a, a, a promising development for the future that we'll have a drug, heat stable carbitocin, which we can rely on rather than oxytocin, which is often um, ineffective because it hasn't adhered to the um, cold chain. Next slide, please. So what about the situation where you've given your uterotonics, you've rubbed up the uterus, you've delivered the placenta, you've checked the cervix and the vagina, there's no bleeding, the woman continues to bleed from the uterus. The next step re um, recommended by WHO is uterine balloon tamponade. It's very widely promoted by international organizations. They are purpose designed balloons, the Bakri, and um, in my opinion, the, the, the best balloon available is the Elavi balloon made by Sanapi in South Africa. I'll speak a little bit about that. And the improvised balloons such as gloves and condoms. On condoms. There have been many observational studies, and I'm sure those of you who have used the balloon have been very impressed because nine times out of 10, if you put a balloon in, the bleeding will stop. Everyone has observed that. 
What we don't know for sure is if you don't put a blue balloon in, would the bleeding have stopped anyway? Next slide, please. So um, there have been two randomized trials. One was conducted in Ben and, and Mali. It was an individually randomized trial um, where women with ongoing bleeding were randomized to either the condom catheter or, or ongoing treatment and the outcomes were significantly worse in the women who had the condom um, balloon than those who had routine treatment. The other was a huge, um, uh, sorry, let's go on to the next slide, please. The other was a cluster randomized trial by Genuity. Um, had, this was a much bigger study where the intervention was training staff to use the um, condom catheter. There were um, 31,000 cases at the hospitals after the training, 28,000 before the training, and the, out, um, the, the uterine balloon tamponade was used much more often after the training, um, but the outcome of PPH surgery needed or deaths per 100,000 births was about twice as common after the intervention as before. So both of these trials are very worrying about whether uterine balloon tamponade really improves outcomes. WHO knows this, they've had, um, they've had discussions, I've been involved in those discussions. They feel at this stage we should continue to recommend uterine balloon tamponade in the context of ongoing research. Next slide, please. So the thing to remember about PPH is that in most cases, the bleeding stops. So our observational studies are very biased because if we, if we use balloon tamponade, nine times out of 10, as I've said, when you put the balloon in, the bleeding stops. Um, but, we, but we can't be absolutely sure that that was the balloon or it would have stopped anyway. We need randomized trials. Next slide, please. So what are our alternatives? Well, um, the trials I quoted were using the condom catheter, which is not a great balloon, I must say. So perhaps we need to use different types of balloon. Next slide, please. Perhaps we need a different uterine balloon tamponade method. And yes, this slide is what we need. And um, in fact, many years ago, when I first moved to Freer Hospital, we started using the glove as a, as a balloon um, in the uterus, but instead of just injecting a fixed volume into the balloon, we inserted the glove balloon into the uterus and can attached it to a liter of saline and suspended the bag uh, a, a meter plus above the patient and just around, allowed free flow so that the balloon would maintain a standard pressure within the, um, within the uterus. And I, I got together with colleagues, um, particularly Gerrit Teron from University of Stellenbosch and others, and we, we put together this uh, monograph. Sue Forkus was the, the main author of this mo monograph. And um, we showed, in fact, the, the, the doctors at Stellenbosch developed this very elegant way of making the balloon, where you cut off the middle finger, you put your catheter, preferably not a Foley's, it can be a Foley's, but preferably a firm plastic catheter, you tie the, the cuff end, you tie a knot in the cuff end, and then you put your catheter through that hole in the middle finger, and then you use the two adjacent fingers, you sort of wrap them around behind and in front, and you tie a knot. And it makes a very nice balloon. Um, it's a funny shape, but it works perfectly, and I think it's much, much better than a cotton balloon. Next slide, please. Um, and, and this is how you put it up with the um, bag uh, about a, a meter plus above the patient with a balloon in the uterus and you keep that open. You can see that's closed off, but you should keep that open so that as the uterus contracts, the fluid can move in and out of the uterus and maintain a consistent pressure uh, without preventing, preventing contraction of the uterus. So this idea, we, we do, let's have the next slide. We, um, we discussed at a workshop um, held by PATH and the SAMRC and um, Sinalpi Biomedical in Cape Town in 2014. And out of this workshop came the Elavi balloon, um, which as I said, I, I think is the best design of balloon so far. It's made locally in Stellenbosch by Sinalpi Biomedical. It's now been exported all over the world. Um, and next slide, please. 
Uh, I think the big benefit of the Alavi balloon is it's not a fixed volume, it's a free flow system where you hang the bag above the patient and as the uterus contracts, the bag can be contracted and the fluid move out of the uterus. Next slide, please. So our alternatives are firstly a different balloon and secondly, um, or a different method of balloon, but thirdly, what about using suction instead of a balloon? Um, on the principle that negative pressure will contract the uterus and therefore, for next slide please, um, support the, um, the physiological mechanism of um, contraction of the uterus closing off the um, spiral artery and supplying blood to the placental bed. So for several years now, suction devices have been used. Next slide please. Um, the, the first, um, as the, this is just to show the mechanism where as the uterus contracts, the, the myometrial fibers form a lattice around the perforating vessels and physically um, obliterate those vessels to stop the bleeding. Next slide, please. So the, the first devices were described from India. They these steel devices, which um, Dr. Panica gave me on one of my trips. I, I photographed this one, which I have in my office. Um, and these were steel devices which were put into the uterus and um, suction applied. And they reported quite a number of cases with 100% efficacy. So just like the balloon, almost every time you put a suction device in and provide suction, the bleeding also stops. Next slide, please. Um, the Alavi device um, is now, uh, is, uh, sorry, the Impress device developed by um, Lydia in North America. It's now called the Jada system. It's a very elegant suction device, um, which is, uh, uh, this, there may be a, um, um, let's just try going to the next slide. We may see a, the device moving. Let's try the next slide. Okay, now it didn't, it didn't work. Let's go back often on Zoom, the thing. So this device is placed in the uterus um, and provided suction. There was a proof of contact study in 10 patients where again, it was effective in 100% or 10 out of 10. The uterus collapsed and the bleeding stopped almost immediately. Next slide, please. And very recently, well, in fact, last year, um, Lydia did a big study in North America, the PULS study, where the, this device, they now call it the um, Jada system, was used in 100, it's actually 107 cases. One had failed, but it, out of the 106 cases, bleeding stopped within three minutes in 94%. So again, such to be a very um, effective way of stopping bleeding, but no randomized trials. Next slide, please. Um, as I've said, you know, we've got good observational study that both clinical, that clinical experience seems to show that balloon tamponade and suction tamponade work in most cases, but randomized trials haven't supported this with balloon and then no randomized trials for suction. Next slide, please. Um, but thinking ahead, um, we were concerned that if the Jada system is as effective as it seems to be, it'll cost at least several hundred dollars. So we're talking many thousands of rand and it's disposable and we really won't be able to afford it. So we looked for alternatives and we decided to test the very simple um, Levine tube, which costs um, literally a couple of rand. I think it's two or three rand. It's, it's, a, it's the Levine stomach tube. You, used for um, stomach washouts. It should be available everywhere in various sizes. Um, and we thought this could be used for uterine suction tamponade. We did a proof of concept study in 45 cesarean cases at Frere where it seemed to work. Um, well, it seemed to um, function. We can't say it worked because we weren't testing whether it was effective, but it functioned, it formed a good seal. None of the cases leaked and there were no complications. Next slide, see, please. We've um, used, this is a picture of the tip of a, this is actually a 36 gauge, but we're now using mainly the 24 gauge um, suction catheter. It's got four holes which sort of are, rotate around the um, tip and it's a soft plastic catheter with a rounded tip. Next slide, please. Um, we've um, tried it as a last 
desperation resort. In three cases at Freer and Cecilia Makiwani, where the patients, in fact, all of these cases had collapsed um, with massive hemorrhage. They were shocked, they were unconscious, they were being taken to theater for laparotomy. Um, we put the suction catheter in, and in all cases, the bleeding stopped, um, and we did not have to go on to surgery. Um, but again, I would hasten to say this doesn't prove that the catheter works. Um, it just proves that it may work, and we need to do randomized trials. We are conducting a randomized trial at the moment at 10 sites in South Africa. Um, next slide, please. Um, and uh, uh, and we, we will know within a year or two whether that whether it really works. There's also a big study planned by WHO testing this um, suction catheter method. We call it suction tube uterine tamponade. Um, and comparing it with the Elovi balloon catheter. Um, thinking ahead, even, even having suction may be a bit of a difficulty in some settings. So we've also looked at using a simple um, manual vacuum aspiration um, syringe. And for example, in our patients, when we've moved them from theater to the ward, um, we've disconnected the electrical suction and just use a simple MVA syringe to maintain suction, and that seems to be, be the trick. So in the long run, run, the simple equipment we might use, if we prove it to be effective, will be a, um, a very cheap catheter, literally a couple of rand, and an MVA syringe, which should be available, I hope, in all of your hospitals. Next slide, please. So um, the final thing I want to talk about is minimizing the delays in treatment. One of the main reasons for um, death from postpartum hemorrhage is um, too little too late, delay in diagnosis. Um, I want to very clearly give a conflict of interest because um, this safe birth tray is, is a thing that I've developed and therefore I have an I have a, an interest in it, and therefore I can't be regarded as, bi as unbiased. But our idea is that if, the, if after delivery, um, well, let me tell you where this idea came from. Over the last 20 years, 25 years, in our research on postpartum hemorrhage, we've used those simple orthopedic plastic fracture bedpans. Um, I'm sure you know them. They've got a sort of a wedge shape, so you can tuck them under a patient who's on traction without moving the patient. And we found those were very effective at collecting all the blood. So we use those to collect blood and measure it. But of course, that was blood that we measured in retrospect. So we had the idea if we made a, a, a sort of a bedpan similar to the fracture bedpan with a wedge that could just be tucked under the patient, but where the blood went into a... Um, container that was um, that was a, me a measuring container. So if you look at that thing, that first circular container has 100 mil graduations. And when it's full, when it reaches 500 mils, it overflows to the next chamber. And our hope is that if we use an, um, a device like this routinely in all births, that we will be able to see clearly how much blood is being lost and we'll pick up postpartum hemorrhage earlier and treat earlier and avoid deaths. Um, this, is, this is purely a hypothesis. It's not been shown, but I'm um, just showing this to you as one of the ideas we have to develop in the future as a way of reducing um, the risk of death from postpartum hemorrhage. Next slide, please. So, Perhaps the future will be routine volumetric monitoring of blood loss after birth for early diagnosis and then early intervention with uterotonics, hopefully a heat stable form of oxytocin, which can be used everywhere. Um, some form of tamponade with whatever is found to be the most effective, whether it's a simple suction tube or whether it's the um, Elavi balloon. Um, but if we use suction, we may be able to use that with a simple integral vacuum source, such as the MVA catheter. Next slide, please. I think that may be the last. Um, I don't think we need to go into this. No, I, think, uh, I think that's a redundant slide. Next slide, please. Um, oh, let's just quickly mention, I've only got two minutes left. Um, please don't forget about uterine rupture. 
Um, it's, a, it's a cause of postpartum hemorrhage if a patient's not responding, even if she's delivered vaginally, even if she's delivered a live baby, the uterus may have ruptured. Let's quickly run through these slides. I forgot I had they just run through the slide. Um, next slide, please. You can look at these at your leisure. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when we use misoprostol to induce labor, uh, we used to break the tablets into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces and put them into the vagina. Next slide, please. Um, this is a patient at Freer Hospital. No previous Caesar. We put one eighth of one tablet of misoprostol, 25 micrograms, into her um, uterus and Five hours later, she had a dead baby in her abdomen and a huge rupture. Next slide, please. So please remember when you use misoprostol to induce labor, use it very cautiously. We actually developed the, me the method at Coronation Hospital, which is now, next slide please, used um, worldwide, which uh, this was our first paper in the SAMJ on titrated oral misoprostol solution. Next slide, please. So all we do is put one tablet in 200 mils of tap water, next slide, shake it up, next slide, um, measure out to 25 mils and give that orally only. That is the maximum starting dose for labor induction with misoprostol and um, never ever use even that dose in a woman with a previous cesarean section. If you want to induce labor safely, um, I'm not going to go to the next slides. The safest method we have to do have today is a Foley catheter. Foley catheter induction, it's a little bit slower, but as effective as misoprostol. It's much, much safer for our patients. So I'd encourage you all to move away from misoprostol, move to Foley inductions. If they fail and you have to use misoprostol, use it very cautiously. And I'm, I'm afraid my time's up. I'm sorry, I didn't want to go on for so long, but we can stop there. Thank you very much, Dylan. Awesome, Prof. Wow, <laughs> that was incredible. Um, thank you so much for that exposition of uh, all of the evidence. Um, it, was, it was a really comprehensive overview. Um, and yeah, I've definitely um, got some thinking to do and there's gonna be some practice changing um, components to that talk for me. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. I think there's, there's so much more that we could cover and um, I would be very interested to hear some of your thoughts on um, the use of misoprostol in in other settings for the you know especially in terms of dosing for for miscarriage management uh, in particular um, because there's yeah there's obviously a big spectrum of 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 gestational ages where we use it and um, I know that you've also done some research looking at the appropriate doses of misoprostol but we'll we'll have to save that for another time. Um, I don't even know if we have time for, for questions, um, but maybe is there anything burning uh, from the audience that they would like to ask before we close? Okay, cool. All uh, right, just checking the chat. Okay, cool. Um, but wow, that was really, really useful. And I think it, yeah, it would be incredible to organize a follow-up um, looking at some of the other things that I mentioned. Um, and uh, thank you so much for all of your effort and your time, Prof. Okay, yeah, may, may I mention one thing very quickly? I did mention last week um, that I'm trying to contribute to the postgraduate teaching at Walter Susulu. So I do um, have a, an obstetric sort of teaching round every Thursday at five, most Thursdays. Um, and also, if you have a clinical problem, particularly an obstetric problem, which you think may benefit from some input from me, please feel free to contact me on WhatsApp or on, um, on, on, uh, on email. And I'm more than happy to, to um, give some support. Um, it's part of my job with Walter Susulu to, to do that. Thank you very much, Dylan. Awesome. Thanks so much, Prof. And uh, have a lovely evening, everyone. <laughs> okay. Thank right. you. Bye. Bye.